G'day everyone, welcome back to another video on the channel. Welcome back to another episode of the Good, Bad and Ugly. We are here for round 8 of the 2023 AFL season. If you're going to enjoy today's video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. That will be much appreciated. And let's get into the episode, kicking off with the goods. So round 8 was a pretty jam-packed round, plenty to go over. We'll kick it off with the first good though. And we will start off with the Brizzy Lions winning interstate. No problems at all. They got the job done convincingly over the Blues by 26 points. And just a really professional display. I know Carlton are having issues with especially their ball use and sort of their method and going in their forward half and very vanilla sort of ball use. But... Uh, the job they did on Kerno Mackay was sensational. The job they did on Cripps was sensational. When you seem to negate those three plays, you can beat a Carlton at the moment because a few of their role players are playing poor, but Lions were just the way better team. Payne and Andrews, sensational job on Kerno and Mackay. We were really able to negate them, and they were fantastic in the air as well, taking a lot of intercept marks. In the midfield, they weren't necessarily a team that smacked Carlton in contest possessions and whatsoever. I thought it was a pretty even game in the contest, but they were just a lot more of a classy team with their ball use, and they were just able to really work off the Blues turnover. And the execution as well inside 50, I thought was superb. Charlie Cameron on the end of four goals. Zach Bailey is just one of those players where he doesn't need many touches to make an impact. Only had the 12 touches but four goals. Thought he played a huge part with just getting that ball, turning it over and turning into a score. And for me, the best on ground, Josh Dunkley was fantastic. 33 disposals, 11 marks, 13 tackles. He was sensational. He Not only did he play a great game individually himself, he was very good overhead. And of course, he was able to really shut down Paddy Cripps, keeping him to, I think, around 17 or 18 disposals. So they did well. So it wasn't necessarily anything like a masterclass from the Lions. I thought they played very well enough to get the win. But just their ability to sort of shut down some of those big Carlton plays. And when you can do that, I think you can win the game of football just because of those better numbers. And they seem to do a lot better off the turnover. Ball skills, very good too and were a clean and classy side on Friday night. So it was a great win for the Lions, and they're in a good position now. The next five games look promising, and a win interstate is just exactly what they needed. Moving on to the next good now. We we're continuing on with the Pies hype train. They're on absolute fire at the moment. It was a fantastic win, really. A really gritty and tough win over a Swan side that were pretty plucky and accurate by 29 points, 11 goals, 11, 6 goals, 12, 77 to 48. Just a, a game where, yeah, not necessarily the Pies dominated in, in any areas, really, but they had a very good start. They were able to get repeated entries. But what they were able to do is their defensive structure and their ability to adapt uh, whilst the Swans were coming was sensational. I thought their back half was excellent. They were able to read Sydney's movements in the air very well, and they were really able to make the Swans struggle with a lot of their ball movement when going to the forward half. They were able to do well in the transition, turning the ball over as well, and when it really mattered, they did pile on the goals with some Awesome goals and very good contested marks as well. Scott Pennery back in the side was fantastic. 31 disposals for him. 25 for Nick Dacos even getting tagged. Look, he didn't really have much impact forward to centre, but just was very serviceable across the back half. And yes, of course, the Pies have a few occasions where they might play ordinary footy. I thought uh, the Swans were quite conventionally the better side in that second term, but they are just such a good team on abling to adapt their game plan to suit their needs, to try and battle out against the Swans. They're able to just really pressure them around the football, get the turnover, and their centre clearance is when it really mattered in that fourth term. They're really able to win those important 50-50s get it forward, and you know, my check on the end of five goals thought he was fantastic. Cox coming back in for structures, he was really good. Quainall, probably one of his career best games, fantastic, and more in the air, brilliant too. So, they're just such an impressive side at the moment, the Pies, you know, it wasn't necessarily such a flashy win or anything, but they got the job done. Um, they're a very, very, very difficult team to beat. Swans had their chance of the few inaccuracies, but so did the Pies as well, so it sort of really uh, balances it out in a way, uh, but yeah, a really strong performance from the Pies. Thought there was some fantastic plays, and they get the job done and uh, on absolute fire moving back up to the top of the ladder and for the final good of the round we'll move on to the Freo Dockers I thought they had a really good win against the Hawks um, over in the west I'll, I'll be honest I did tip the Hawks I thought they could get the upset bit of a disrespectful tip in the end as they smashed the Hawks the Dockers by 69 points and what I really liked about their win when watching a bit of the game back was just their daring ball use. Um, that's what really did catch my eye. They sort of did show that last week against the Lions, but they just couldn't execute. Thought their ball skills were pretty poor. Lions were just able to really... They're, they're a very good side, the Lions, on executing off the turnover. So, you know, sort of self-explanatory, the better side. But against the Hawks, where, yeah, they probably are having problems in defense, I just thought some really good daring ball use. Hayden Young was fantastic. In my eyes, 26 touches. And also, of course, you know, Luke Ryan back there and George 
Jordan Clark, I thought, had a decent game across half-back as well. Transition game was pretty strong. They loved to use the corridor on that game too. I thought they were very good in that aspect. And Brayshaw, Andy Brayshaw is a really key player on AB Link to get those transition plays because he's usually the link in the chain on most of their attacks. Has a lot of marks, has a lot of disposals, and he sure did. 34 disposals, 9 marks. He's really back to his best. And he said he was paying free, I think, at the start of the week. So yeah, with him also going forward and kicking two goals, He's their shining light. He really needs to get going. And if he can get going alongside Sarong, I think they can really now start to churn wins. I've got the Swans this week at the SCG. So with a bit of a smaller ground, are they able to keep on using that daring ball use? So that's just something that really did catch my eye in their win. It was flawless. They played some great football and a big win over the Hawks. Just what they needed to try and resurrect their season. Moving on to the three Bards now. We'll kick it off the Giants. And I thought they were pretty gallant to defeat over the Bulldogs. But... The Giants this year are just one of those oh-so-close teams. They are so close from really generating more wins on the season and could be a smoky chance of finals, but something's missing with them, and I just think their execution and the chances they are wasting is really hurting them, and to be honest, it probably was another one on display against the Bulldogs. Had a lot of chances um, to really execute in their forward half, but were failed to capitalize, and they just have a few surges throughout games where they just have poor defensive moments. They have those surges, the Giants, when they lose a lot of intensity around the ball. I think the turnovers can be quite concerningly bad as well. Of course, they had some superstars in there. Tom Green was fantastic with 38 touches and three goals, but I just think with how the Giants are playing, they should be playing in a way that gets them wins. I think they're much better than a bottom four side from what I've seen this year, but just those moments throughout quarters, you know, they're still, I guess, a young side and a team on the up. Um, they're going to have losses like that, but they've had just a lot of games now where they've lacked execution in certain moments. They've lost, you know, so certain surges where they've lost a bit of intensity around the football, um, and they were pretty much just outclassed by the Bulldogs in the end. So for me, they did have those wasted chances. I thought their inside 50 use was... Pretty mediocre. They left it a little bit too late to come back. And, you know, when they did come back, um, they just let the the door, the, the gate open again with uh, Norton kicking the ceiling in the end. So, yeah, for the Giants, look, pretty gallant of defeat, but uh, wasted chances really did hurt them. Again, moving on to the next bad now, and we will stick with the Carlton Blues. Just a very average display on Friday night uh, against the Brisbane Lions. Now, this probably should have been a 40-point-plus loss, but they did get a bit of junk time winning the fourth term with a few junk time goals. Uh, but that's a concerning display for Carlton. I was really big on heading uh, for, for the Blues heading into this season. I had them top four. Thought they could really blitz it with a few of their role plays, improve on their clearance game, uh, improve on just their um, exciting four and a half use and pressure. It, it really was on show last year. And Curran and Mackay as well, self-explanatory. They've got superstars in there. They're just such an underwhelming team to watch. Like they are genuinely average from what I did see on Friday night. Their turnovers were poor. They had countless, countless turnovers when they tried to take their game on. I think from minute one, you could see that. They were trying to take the game on through the corridor, try and bomb it a little bit less down the line and, you know, directly down the line to Colonel Mackay, etc. But I think combined with Colonel Mackay were negated quite well from Payne and Andrews and they were unable to take marks. And Cripps has held well. When that happens, they just lose their mongrel to really try and win games. They don't get enough, again, from output players. A lot of turnovers, especially in their back half. And, you know, the, the Lions were just able to capitalize um, just with their classy forwards and some really high execution from their part. They just seem to be a very one-dimensional team at the moment, the Blues. When you can shut out Kerr and Mackay, that just seems to be the the, the ingredient to, to beat the Blues because that's all they got going at the moment. Again, tried to get, take the game on, but it wasn't good enough. They turned the ball over too much. But then when they play slow, they just play too slow. So they, it's almost like a lose-lose situation at the moment for the Blues. I know a lot of fans are obviously not, not happy at all. Maybe Michael Voss isn't the man for the Blues. I, I don't know if I said on the channel, but I think I have. If Michael Voss doesn't get the Blues to finals this year, I think he could be sacked. You know, it's 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 inexcusable the list I have the Blues to, to be where they are. They're playing genuinely such average footy, uh, not getting enough with a few players, and their ball skills have been very, very poor. So, yeah, it's, it's concerning for the Blues at the moment. Um, but... You know, I think just given their list, you still back them to, to try and galvanize some sort of form in the latter, latter parts of the season. But we're not seeing it at the moment. They are playing some very, very poor and average footy. And for the final bad in this video today, I'll move on to the Hawks. And, you know, we, we've seen a few of these performances so far this year where their defense just turns to absolute dust after the first term or the first half. 
it did against the Dockers. They were able to really march to victory and just get a get a real grip in that second term, kicking consecutive goals. And oh, just just watching and their defence is such a genuine mess sometimes. You know, sometimes I think Sicily and the likes of Frost as well can play good patches of footy and a few of their back half plays can can be quite decent. But that's just been their probably their most biggest concern in my opinion with the Hawks. Defence has just been absolutely shocking. You know, Sicily seems like the only man back down there. Frost can be a decent player, but the amount of free kicks and lack of discipline he gives is really on such high notice, um, especially when the Hawks aren't playing great football. And defending the transition, they were quite poor at, you know, defending the corridor, they were not so great at. They were just allowed, allowing Freer to freely move the ball really around the ground way too easily. Uh, and the inside 50 entries were, were really too good uh, for the Hawks' defense. There is a bit of upside with them. They are still a young team, the Hawks. I thought, again, the midfield, the clearance game is actually turning to be out quite nicely. But, you know, just in area, other areas around the ground, defense is just way too inconsistent. When going forward, um, they they're just showed a lack of chemistry and a lack of cohesion going in there. But the, the, their defense is the big problem. They just give up scores way too, way too highly, way too quickly. And look, from what the latter is suggesting, they're sort of on track to be a team that could you know, never know if they're playing like this. They could finish on one win with around 50%. I don't think that'll be the case, but geez, you know, one week they could play some respectable footy. The other, they are playing like a genuine, you know, VFL side with some of their defensive displays. So yeah, defense has just been all over the shop and it certainly was against the Dockers. Move on to the uglies now. There are plenty of uglies to go over. We'll kick it off with the first one though. This team right here, the Sydney Swans, it's a bit embarrassing wearing this uh, jumper on me right now, but it's getting bad to worse now for the Swans. And Look, I felt it was, well, it fits for what the category they're in. It was an ugly performance and it is getting bad and worse for them now against the Pies. And, oh, look, you know, I think just throughout multiple areas of that game, they, they really struggled to, to gain a grasp for a full full quarter performance. Um, that second term, I thought they were playing a bit of shades of what they showed last year. Their foot, their foot skills, their pressure, um, their ability to control the game. We did see that in the second term and I thought they had a very good second quarter, but... This is the issues they keep on having. Execution. Their goal kicking has been shocking. They can, I think, two goals nine or two goals ten from set shots. I wouldn't say that's what necessarily cost them the game, but it was a huge factor, especially in the terms of scoreboard pressure. And in that second half, there's something wrong with their with their ability to play four full quarter performances because they just seem to lose a lot of fatigue and intensity around the ball, and their method and their game plan just goes totally out the window. You know, I think I still think you yeah, have players playing wrong positions. For me, Francis should be a defender. He was fantastic against the Giants. He plays forward. Um, some just really inconsistencies. The structural problems, again, with their defense, you know, conceding a lot of contested marks in that fourth term. They're just a whole hot mess at the moment. And, of course, getting in Nick Dacos's head and everything with going after him, I thought that was probably a little bit over the top. Like, they didn't necessarily need to do that. They got a bit too fired up uh, for that. But, look, the upside of the Swans is their effort, I thought, was really good. Um, and their intensity was good. They just lacked a lot of execution. And when it does matter, they lose fatigue and they lose those crucial 50-50s, especially in the late stage of the game. Their fourth terms have been very poor and that's what's costing them games. And if you look at the expected scores, they're a team that is top four. They are top four for expected scores. They're just wasting their chances. And if they were able to kick a lot more accurately, this game could have been genuinely a lot closer and they really could have won this game. So there's really two... St two sides to the story um, with the Swans with this game but in the end it was another really disappointing performance from them and they're in a concerning spot three wins five losses you'd think they bounce back right I'm not too sure execution again poor and in the end they just weren't able to really keep up with especially in the center clearances they were all terrible um, in those in those late stages of the game um, but yeah Really need to have a good, hard look at themselves, the Swans, um, for these four four quarters. I think mentally they're not right at the moment. That's their big problem as well. Maybe off the field they're having issues too. Swans, not good enough. Um, and yeah, they moved to three wins and five losses. Not good to see. Move on to the next ugly now. And it's just I'm going to be putting in the end of the Demons and Suns game. Now, I want to say there's two ways to look at it in terms of ugly. There's the ugly in a positive way where, geez, you know, this was such an entertaining game to watch. It almost was an ugly affair with how heavily contested this was and bodies crushing and this was seriously a very under underrated game to watch and a respectable performance from the Suns. And then there's ugly in the other terms of things of Charlie Ballard getting stretched off after a Van Royen hit that you know, probably was justified in, um, on being suspended. And the free kick dramas at the end, 
I do understand that, you know, obviously the Suns had a few goals from free kicks during that third term and, and etc. But the ending of a few of those free kicks that really could have been paid. King not paid and Chol not paid. Um, but again, you know, it ended with McPherson missing in front of goal. We should have kicked that. It was, um, yeah, a really ugly ending to that game. There's really multiple ways to think about that. But yeah, the Suns should be pretty disappointed. I guess disappointed with not picking up that win, but still very proud. I think Stuart Drew should be with the ending um, of that game. You can see they are really now starting to turn into a whole new side. They're a very strong contesting clearance side and they batted the Demons in a few of those numbers. So I thought, you know, if I'm a Suns fan, I should be very proud of what I did see. Nara Anderson looks to be a superstar, 37 disposals, a goal to his name and he's just a game changer in there. His work ethic is second to none. He was really able to match up well against Clean Oliver, beat him in almost every statistical department and it was such a scrap fest with that final term, an ugly sort of display to watch. Um, but yeah, in the end, Look, I thought the Suns did get a little bit of shafted um, with a few of those no calls from the umpires, but it is what it is. They happen, um, but I still felt the Ds were, were pretty strong in the end to, to hold on to the wing. Um, but yeah, I could see a the, the, lot of the frustration on social media, so I almost had to add this into the ugly category of just the ending of that game, of course, with Charlie Barley getting stretched off as well. It was a pretty ugly ending to that game, uh, but both teams played very well. Suns unlucky, the Ds continue to march on. And for the final ugly in this video today, I've got to finish it off with some of the ugly, poor goal kicking there was this weekend. Of course, the Swans were awful, uh, kicking two goals nine with set shots. I still th thought with the chances they did have, they generated some decent inside 50s, but their goal kicking was terrible. And honestly, if they were able to execute, at least, you know, sort of square the ledger with those goal scoring opportunities, it could have been much closer to the game and an opportunity to really win that. And then you move over to the other Sunday game, four goals, 10 for the Roos. I thought they were actually very competitive um, with watching a, few, a, a little bit of the game back and their second half was actually quite, um, you know, a really highly competitive effort, especially against a good Saints side. But same with the Saints as well. I think they're on the one goal nine threat at some stage of that game. Didn't catch the whole game, but just... The, the goal kicking was poor, really, throughout most of the weekend. Even the Tigers as well, even though I do have to give them credit, it was a fantastic win that second half against the Eagles. Really put Eagles to the sword, and efficiency was much better. But in the first half, it was pretty poor. A lot of points they were, again, kicking. Um, I don't think necessarily any team was really that accurate, but a team that was accurate was the, S, was the Dons, but not Port Adelaide. I think now were nine goals, 15 threat, some sort of stage. They ended up kicking 12 goals, 20. Um, there's really something wrong, with, especially with just these goal scoring opportunities um, <laughs> and the set shots from what I did see over the weekend. There were a few that really went begging. I mean, obviously with the Swans game, Pedal Adams missing directly in front. You get games where players like Kerno and Cameron can kick nine goals and then you get games with just some of the ugly uh, goal kicking. Uh, that is definitely safe to say. Uh, but that's something that just really did catch my eye over the weekend, especially the games. Uh, ending up on Sunday. Some really, really poor goal kicking. So everyone, there was another episode of the Good, Bad and Ugly for round eight of the 2023 AFL season. Plenty of ups and downs throughout the round. So feel free to let me know your thoughts on the round down below. Love to hear your fellas' thoughts and this, especially with the concept of this, of this video. I'm not really able to go over every single game of the round, but maybe in the future, I might start doing that. But yeah, I'm enjoying these series, fellas. Um, uh, the support on these videos have been very good too. So I always really appreciate your support. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you want to enjoy. Enjoy. And until next time, I will talk to you later. See you later, fellas.